All right, if I can have everybody bring it in close, please. All right, guys, welcome. My name's Scott, and we are from Battlefield Vegas. I'd like to welcome you all back to Big Sandy again. I am standing on an M50 Sherman. This Sherman uh, ended its life as an Israeli design. But uh, to get to that point, we have a very long uh, period of events and changes to make this tank. So we're going to start from the beginning of the timeline, talk a little bit about the history, and then after that, I'll move on to some capability and specs about the tank itself along with changes they made along the way. So this tank was a World War II US built. This tank was built in the Chrysler factory in Detroit. An interesting note about the Chrysler factory is that that factory was completely funded by the US Army and built specifically to make Sherman tanks and it was run by Chrysler. So that tank was birthed out of that factory uh, probably around early to mid-war, World War II. Uh, this tank served in World War II. However, where it served in World War II is a bit of a gray area for several reasons. Uh, but more than likely, because of where this tank ended up, it was in the European theater, either with the US or on the Lend-Lease program. In the Lend-Lease program, the U.S. had an arrangement with countries like Britain, France, Russia, and they loaned these tanks out to them for the war. So most likely, this tank was with the Lend-Lease program. So once again, this tank was in World War II. However, during World War II, it didn't quite look like it does now. So in World War II, it was a M4A4, which had the small, low-velocity 75-millimeter gun. Uh, it had the single row track pads. It had the oldest style of Sherman vertical suspension. And it didn't quite look like it does right now. So the reason we can't trace history back that far is because units in the US would paint serial numbers on the tank. And units had their own serial number or registration number that didn't necessarily correspond with the serial number stamped on the tank. So as the tank progressed and moved to other countries into other service, that US registration number was, was taken off. So unfortunately, we, we do not know where this tank was during World War II. However, post-World War II, France took on a, a large number of Shermans that were left in the European theater. We're at about post-war France now, and we're going to start to talk about the modifications that this tank had to get to this point. So initially, this tank had what's called the Chrysler multi-bank engine, which is an incredible piece of technology and quite, quite rare these days. However, basically, it's an inline engine, however, five of them wrapped around a single drive line. After World War II, the French had a large surplus of the radial R975 engine, the same engine that's in some aeroplanes. Because of the large surplus of radials they had, the French fitted the radials into this tank. And we know this because on the back of the tank here, you see air vents on the back, which was the air intake for the radial. And then through the center of the back deck there, for those of you that know radial engines, you have to do a pre-startup pre-wind to prevent hydraulic lock. So this tank had the recess that was cut for that purpose. So that, we're getting into solid evidence of how we know this tank came to be what it is. So we had the French do that fitting. So once the State of Israel was formed post-World War II, the Israelis decided they needed to start building a military building armor. So Israel sent a development team to France to develop a type of tank. They looked at several tanks and they liked the gun that is in the AMX-13. However, for some reason, they, they couldn't quite come through with the AMX-13, which is a French tank. But what the Israeli development team did with France was they got the gun out of an AMX-13, which is this gun. This gun is a CN-7550 high-velocity 75. 
So a lot of you that were here last year that saw our other 75 mil Sherman. The 75 Sherman during World War II was relatively low velocity, a very small short round. Whilst this is a 75, this thing has a lot of power behind it and this round was designed predominantly for anti-tank warfare. So what they did was the AMX-13 had this gun in it with an auto loader. The development team with Israel and France took that gun, removed the auto loader and married the gun into this tank. But because this is such a large gun, they had to make several heavy modifications to this turret. So one of the modifications I'm talking about, they got that small World War II turret, they cut off the front end and they had to add a giant carriage mantlet which is at the front here. And you can see, if you take a closer look, where they cut it and added it onto the front. That was purely to take up the space of how much bigger this gun was. Then what they had to do at the rear of the turret was add more counterweight so the turret would spin evenly on its bearing race. So this piece at the back here, you can see where they cut it and re-welded this larger section. So this turret gives you the iconic shape of an M50 Sherman. So when you're looking for this thing, the two key things to look for is that gun and the modifications to the turret. That's how we spot an M50. So it was initially developed with the gun and the turret in France. A couple of them went to Israel early on and they took part. Uh, the, the first conflict the M50 was in was called the Suez Crisis. And it is quite possible that this tank was at that crisis. And then there are several other uh, incursions and confrontations through that era. However, uh, <clears throat> sometime in the mid 60s, Israel began making the M50 themselves. So all those early modifications they did in France, they then started doing in-house in Israel. So we're in about the mid 60s now, going into the 70s. The Six Day War, I'm sure a lot of you might be familiar with. These played a huge role in the Six Day War. This tank was in the Six Day War. However, during the, the development of the tank, the Israelis decided they need to make more modifications to make this thing work. They were very happy with the gun. They were happy with generally the overall uh, design of the hull, but they needed to do upgrades. So the Israelis decided that that French uh, when the French put the radial engine in there, it was too underpowered to move this tank at the speed they wanted. So the Israelis had an arrangement with Cummins in America and brought a huge lot of Cummins diesel engines. So the engine that is in this tank now is a Cummins VT460 turbo diesel engine. These engines did not really circulate inside the US. Almost all of those engines went directly to Israel and fitted into these tanks, along with the M51, a different type of Israeli Sherman. To get the engine in there, they had to make modifications to the back deck and to the engine bay, but it was a relatively easy conversion. So after that point, with all the extra added weight, uh, high-powered engine, they then decided the tank was so heavy, the track profile was too thin. They were having maneuverability issues through the sand in the desert. So they decided to do the extended track pad upgrade. Now the US had already done this upgrade during World War II on a lot of the Shermans, the late war Shermans that you guys have seen in the movies. The Israelis essentially carried out that same modification on this tank. So they basically got an earlier style of track that was one single row of track pad and they doubled them up so now we have a wider uh, profile on the ground, we have better traction, we have better maneuverability. So as far as the technology and modifications, that is the Israeli M50. So the tank took part in the Six Day War and then also moved on into the Yom Kippur War in the 70s. So by this time the Israelis uh, have got their markings all pretty well close to what you see right now on the tank. Now the Israelis, uh, they figured out that uh, lessons they learned from World War II, that after a vehicle was hit and burnt, that serial number that was painted on was burnt off. 
So they had trouble sometimes actually recognizing which tank it was and who the crew was. So the Israelis started to weld the serial number onto the tank. And if you guys look at the front and the back of the tank there, that white number in the black box, uh, initially that was welded on there. And you can see where that, that welded number was also grind off because this tank did not finish its service with Israel. So now we're moving on into Lebanon, 1982. Uh, at that time, this tank was, uh, compared to what Israel had coming into the scene, uh, the Century and the 105, they had the Makaba tank coming on scene. Uh, they had a lot of these M50s in surplus and in reserve. So the Israelis had a deal with the South Lebanese army, the Christian militia, and they gave 36 M50 Shermans to the South Lebanese army, SLA. And we know this because the South Lebanese army ground off the Israeli serial number and they welded a plate with a welded number on it. So this tank is 016, the 16th tank of the 36 tanks that went to the Christian militia. So now we've narrowed our history right down to a key point. Now the Christian militia, they changed the whole camouflage pattern of this tank and the tank became like a, a very dark blue gray and in some cases green tiger stripe on it. Uh, it's photos of this tank with the Christian militia are very uncommon to see these days. However, there are some guys in the UK from Eden Camp who are doing an M50 restoration and they are doing their tank in the Christian militia color. So I would like to say a special thank you to Frank Wood of Eden Camp. If it wasn't for some of Frank's guidance, our restoration here today would not have been possible. I'd also like to thank Mark Serring of the American Wartime Museum in uh, Virginia, I believe. If it wasn't for Mark's generosity loaning us parts, we wouldn't have been able to make this tank fully operational. So I'd like to shout out to Mark as well. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the museum life of the tank. So after the Lebanon conflict, uh, these tanks went back to Israel and they actually sat in the Israeli reserve for a period, however they weren't used. Now there was a gentleman in the UK, the AF Budge collection, he actually had a deal with the Israeli government. He imported, I believe, about 12 M50s into the UK. Sometime thereafter, a lot of those M50s came here to the US. So this tank went from the AF Budge collection, it came into the US with some collectors. This tank was then at the Littlefield collection, which is now closed in California, and now Battlefield Vegas. <coughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about armament, crew, and specs really quickly. This tank has a crew of five. You have a driver, a bow gunner, a gunner, a loader, and a crew commander. In terms of armament, we have a 1919 down in the bow. We have a 1919 coaxial machine gun. We have the additional 1919 at the front of the crew commander. We have the M2 Mardus, and then we have the high velocity 75 French gun. Interestingly enough, the Israelis got the 1919, and a lot of you know they converted it to 7.62308. So we actually have Israeli 1919s in the tank today, and you'll see those firing later on. Okay, the main armament. <coughs> so this is the round we're gonna be firing today, or we have just fired. So as you can tell, compared to the standard 75 of World War II, there's a lot of power behind this round. It's about a 12 pound projectile, and we have about four pounds of powder behind it. And we're going to be sending this thing down range at about 3,000 feet per second. And a lot of you now, I'm sure, are familiar with the muzzle brake on this thing. It sends quite a crack. All right, guys, that's basically it for the history on the tank. One more thing I would like to say. Uh, a lot of you guys have your phones out right now. We have a gentleman at Battlefield Vegas who covers all of our restoration work. He comes in on his own time and he films what we do. So if you guys are interested to see how we bring these tanks back to life, go on to YouTube and follow a channel called Restoration Passion. There you can see all the steps we take to make these tanks come back to life.
Oh, fuck.